happy to welcome each and every one of you to this special session, which has been curated as a conversation between Dr. Bimal Patel and architect Naresh Narsimhan and architect Vijay Narapati. Dr. Patel, at least in the recent past, has been someone who's been hard to ignore, be it in the field of practice or in that of education. Talking of education, we're really happy that NASA, our student body, has joined us as a partner. And we're happy to see many students participating today and many colleges encouraging participation too. Gratitude to both NASA as well as the partner colleges. The fact that Dr. Patel has been on at least two more well-attended sessions in the last uh, uh, couple of weeks, and yet we had uh, 700 plus signups, I'm sure a lot more are going to join up for this session, with over 100 questions. Um, that we receive to our call is a clear indication of the interest people have in him and the work he does. His projects and his stands at SEPT, the institution that he steers, has invited a lot of opinions and viewpoints from those in the profession and outside as well. We thought it was important to hear from the man himself. A warm welcome, Dr. Patel, to you on ASEC. Thank you. I thank Naresh and Vijay for agreeing to anchor this session. It has been quite a task sifting through all the questions we've received and putting them together in this format. Naresh and Vijay, Naresh Narsiman from Venkatramnan Associates and Vijay from Maya Praxis, Vijay Nagapati from Maya Praxis, run rather different types of practices and hence bring with them different viewpoints as well to this conversation. Naresh manages a large practice started by his illustrious father, who incidentally is also attending this session which holds, the, the practice holds the ability to handle a range of projects. While Vijay, along with his wife, Dimple Mittal, run a comparatively small but sensitive practice called Maya Praxis. Both have been involved in public pro projects and education, through, though to different extents. Vijay is associated closely with Christ University in Bangalore. And hence, both should be able to relate to the positions and perspectives that have been the topic of much debate centered around our guest for today, Dr. Bimal Patel. I now leave the stage to Naresh and Vijay to take it from here. Over to you, Naresh and Vijay. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Geeta. So once again, I am Naresh Narsimhan. And together today with my colleague and fellow architect, Vijay Narnapati, we're going to have an interesting conversation with Dr. Patel, who is the managing director, chairman and managing director of Ahmedabad-based HCP Architects. HCP, as you already know, has been commissioned to redesign the central vista among many other major urban design projects in Bangalore. And this central vista is probably India's, will be India's largest architectural commission since independence. So Bimal, let's get going. Let's start with the elephant in the room. India's largest commission since independence was awarded to you. Many people allege that maybe you didn't get this job only on merit or on design quality, but also because you're close to the ruling dispensation in the country right now. Is there any truth to this? No. There's no truth to that. Uh, there was a competition. Uh, eligible firms applied and turned in their entries. There was a selection process procedure and we were selected. Um, and so that's what it is. Uh, we participate in many competitions. Uh, few we win, many we lose. I'm sure you have similar sort of an experience. So that's, that's what this is about. Jay? Let me, uh, let me ask a follow up on that. Actually, um, let's say there is a, a, a process for the for this kind of projects, and especially this being such a national level project, uh, everybody's attention and imagination is on it. They, is, should there have been a more transparent or uh, better process to select the architect? Do you think there was enough? Also, do you think there was enough background research and scrutiny that informed the brief? You know, these two things. Uh, well, there. Uh, you're, you're actually asking two questions. One is background and scrutiny regarding the brief right. and, uh, uh, and, and, and could the process be, could that have been better? Um, if I were to answer the, 
well, let's start with the, the, the second one, this, this thing about the process being better. Right. Uh, I think that's a statement that could be made about rules and processes for many different things in our country, almost in every sphere. Whether you talk about rules and processes in banking sector, whether you talk about them in medical sector, in education sector, in electoral issues, everywhere India requires reform of processes, reform of rules. So there's no, I mean, who could disagree that these processes could be better? I, I wouldn't disagree. I wouldn't say that they could be better. But it's not specialized to our profession. Our profession, everything needs to be all, all, all processes need to be better also. Uh, you're practicing architects. Uh, rules regarding fees, regarding architectural education, rules regarding what kind of firms should be there, what should be the structure of firms. All of these rules and processes were created at a time uh, in the 70s when India was very different. And many of them could do with improvement. Uh, with regard to competitions, architectural competitions, I think they also, the rules could be much better. Uh, you know, we, there are many, many, many competitions we participate in. There we, like everybody else, feel, well, this could have been done better. And I think, having said that, I mean, there, there's, you know, still one, one goes on because the rules when they change, how they change, will change. With regard to competitions, I think we need to pay a lot. We, we, the, these rules were also framed a long time ago. Uh, um, we need rules that take many things into consideration. Take competitions. We need to take into consideration, uh, 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 you know, that there's not one type of competition. There, are, there, are, there could be multiple different types of competition depending on different types of projects. Uh, I've written elsewhere that uh, that some projects require a design competition, some projects require a process for selecting architects. I think the two are completely different issues. Uh, somewhere you need design, somewhere you select architects. Not everywhere design process works, or design competition works. Somewhere you need a balance between the two. Uh, you need to make rules and processes for competition that are acceptable not only to architects, but also acceptable to clients. Clients have, uh, have their own demands on what they want competitions to be like, how they want them to be judged, etc. So I wouldn't disagree with you that we need uh, improvement in these processes and that, uh, that, that all of us would be better off if these processes were done better. But as it were, these are, this is the present uh, system within which we operate and we all operate within those and, 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 and us too. So, um, so that's that. Uh, you asked a, a second issue. Now I've forgotten what that second issue was. What transparency of the process? Could that, should well, the process uh, you see the question of, I, I wouldn't say transparency so much as you need settled rules, you see, that everybody accepts. Uh, 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 and and, 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 and uh, um, it's uh, one, you know, uh, the, the problem with Indian, uh, we, we, it's almost everything. Forget competition, architectural competition, or even other things that we do. Because these rules are not settled, uh, we spend more time fighting about the rules than playing the game. I mean, imagine in cricket if the rules were not settled. What would happen? Uh, you would end up, uh, uh, um, in a sense, spending more time fighting about the rules than playing the game, in a sense. And that's what happens. And I agree that these could be better. Uh, but that's they are what they are right now. Lots of firms participate in these competitions, and we do too. So that was that. And you, you, you actually asked something else, but I've now forgotten what, what that was. You said something else. Uh, um, Sorry? But there was a speaking uh, third thing that... Uh, I, can't, I can't hear you. Nadesh, I can't hear you clearly. Vijay, continue. Shall I? Yeah. I think if you have something, please go ahead. I'm, I was going to ask about the master planning process. But ahead, it's a huge uh, project, extremely important. Uh, 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 yeah, 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 yeah. I remember now what. Symbolically. I remember now Doesn't what. It have, 
I remember you asked a question of okay. the brief could be a little better developed or something of that sort. Is 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 an issue yeah, that, that you raised? Am I? Is that that's an issue that you raised, right? Right. Now these two I've written about elsewhere, and I'd recommend you know if you I've written about this in an article I did for LA Journal recently. Uh, you know, very very often people come with projects that are nebulously thought out. I'd say that's more often the case than somebody coming with a perfect brief. In fact, in architecture schools, we teach that design is a process through which you actually firm up the brief very often. And that is true, for example, when you do design houses for people, people come and say, here's my plot, I want to do a house. And, 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 and they have lots of ideas in their head about what they have seen elsewhere, what kind of facilities they want, etc., etc. all sorts of things in their head. It's quite, quite nebulous what they tell you. And we as architects, as you well know, we'll start the design process and start interrogating the site and the, and the brief and through that discover what actually is possible on that site and what is not possible. Okay. Now this is, this is perfectly legitimate. This happens in every project to say that you would have an ironclad brief and that this will be absolutely well worked out in detail is to say that the design is done. Okay? And so I, 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 I fail to understand this, uh, this concern that, that a brief is nebulous. Almost always the brief is nebulous. Industrialists come to us and say, listen, I have this large piece of land and I'm thinking of setting up a factory like this. And I'm... Or sometimes somebody comes and says, we have this river here and it's a mess and we need to do something about it. We don't know what, can you please start working on it? And it is through that you discover the process. So I don't see a problem with that. In fact, I think one of the jobs of an architect is to help the client firm up the brief by looking at what is what what is possible. Many opportunities come up. Now, I, I have the good fortune of also being a client in some cases at CEPT. And I work with architects, uh, fine architects at CEPT, when we say, for example, we say, uh, listen, we need a library, but we don't know what a library is in this day and age of the internet. And we start working with the architect and we start through the process of design, we're actually discovering what a library except can be like. You could, you could say, what's that? No, that's, that's exactly it. It's through that process that you discover what the possibilities of the site are, what can be done, what cannot be done. It's been likewise when I worked with IIM, when I've been an architect, we've been in Institute of Management. They, have a new, they want a new campus. They have not a clear idea of how many classrooms they want, how many, you know, what exactly is the function. In fact, while we are designing, they're just going, ah, oh, that's a good idea. Let's do this. Let's do the other. Uh, and even after starting construction, <laughs> in some cases, you find that people discover that, uh, oh, no, my requirements have changed. I need to do something different. No, so no, maybe, uh, as real architects, maybe, that's how we work. Maybe I think in my mind, the brief is different from programming. And then the, it happens. You, what you're saying exactly uh, happens, but the brief in this case, being what the project is, and not only these, this project, several of the projects you're doing are, are really complex. So uh, don't you think there should have been a, a lot more, maybe perhaps inclusive consultation? I don't know, it's, it's not your owners, but I'm just thinking that would that have been a process that would have strengthened your design, perhaps more better informed. And so the demand for a brief is different from a demand for programming, which probably you will be undertaking right now, but a brief is different, right? I, I, is, could you please flesh out a little better what you mean by brief and program? So the brief, brief sets out, especially because the, the project is a vision. You're envisioning what is, you're not being asked to give detailed designs, to a great extent, but it, what is the vision of the project? And you explain that through your design. So the, the client sets out exactly what they have in mind, but that, that in this case, being a quite a complex and uh, culturally important project, has to have 
the depth of thinking that uh, data that is required, uh, perhaps even uh, uh, a kind of uh, philosophical um, sort of statement. Um, did the brief have all those things? And do you think that you actually understand and respond to it better? I, I can see what you're saying, but uh, I've never had a client who comes to me with a sort of, uh, 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 you know, uh, let's say, uh, with, a, with the deepest understanding, philosophical understanding of what they're doing. That's part of what an architect helps them understand, or the philosophical significance of what they're doing. And that's really the job of an architect in, in many ways. The best architects help you you know, when somebody comes to a house, they're coming really with functional requirements. I want a house, I want this, but what you're helping them think through is what their notion of the good life is. If, you, if, you're, doing, if you're doing a house or a bungalow for somebody, you know, you start saying, okay, so listen, here's an opportunity to think through your life and what do you think is valuable, what is not. And that's really what an architect helps them do. That, that's what we are good at doing. Uh, usually people come with functional requirements. And in this case, Parliament needs modernization. This has been talked about since, uh, since, since a long period of time, uh, uh, you know, and, 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 and so it needed to be done. Uh, a central secretariat is required. Uh, that also was something that was talked about since, uh, you know, subsequently we discovered that this has been going in the works for, for you know, that, that such a need is felt. We need to create infrastructure for administration for all the people to be together. This was there. The Republic Day Parade is very difficult to organize and, and is disruptive for the whole central vista and that needs to be improved. So that was another chunk of it. Uh, Vice President is complaining about the infrastructure that he has and, and the kind of, you know, he had, uh, if, you, if you go and really see the facilities that have been provided for him, uh, he has uh, many things that are needed there office office infrastructure etc which was never built and that's needed all of these things sort of are the functional requirements that a client is to come up to you with i think we will and i think really, uh... and it's just I'm, i just finished uh, and it's really the job of the architect to help put together what this is and how this is going to be done so i don't see a client uh, uh, coming to you with this, I, 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 let me put it this way. I, I don't see anything unusual in this. Most projects that I've done in the public realm have been, have been like this. Uh, I say, listen, we want to do something here. We know there's a functional problem here. Why don't you help us fix it? And, and indeed, that's what architects mm. help do. So what you're saying is that what you see is a fuzzy logic in a brief. There's some kind of logic, but it's very fuzzy. It's very but fuzzy. I want to ask you a more direct question. No, no, but it's, it's for you to tease it out yeah, and for you to to, to, to put it together at various levels, at a functional level, how it works and what might be done, also at a philosophical level. Uh, you know, so I, 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 so that, I, that, uh, that actually brings me to another question which a uh, lot of people have been asking, saying that, see, typically of projects of this scale, you know, this large scale that we're talking about, you know, uh, what about close to, uh, I think, uh, 300, how many hectares? About, uh, I think you get, the data is here somewhere about, 300 hectares of land is involved in the master planning of this uh, new project. People are asking, and it's also super uh, important architecturally, well, politically, symbolically, all the good stuff. So the point is really speaking that, is it not better to separate the master planner from the individual architect, like what they have done probably in the Washington Mall or maybe in other places in the world, where the uh, master planner sets the master plan and also creates a urban design framework and say a building control rule so that everything people and allow uh, uh, individual buildings to be built by different architects which will create variety and as a corollary to that uh, whether uh, what i'll do is i'll ask the second corollary after you answer this but if why do you think that the master plan do you think that the master planner and the building architect being together is a good thing well you know there are projects done both ways. It's not as if, you know, first of all, let's, let's issue the, this issue of scale. Uh, we, you know, um, I'm not saying this is a small project, but I think we need to uh, uh, wrap our 
heads around larger scale as India progresses, as things become, uh, you know, as, as, as we go ahead and our capacities develop, both of our economy and of our professional sector, projects of this size are not going to seem completely unusual. They better not. The kind of problems that we have, if we think that they have to be all solved in tiny bits, it's not going to work. It, it, this is, we, we are going to have to, you know, this is not a scale that, you know, I remember the time uh, uh, just after liberalization when the, when, when, when uh, you know, when, when we started tackling larger scales, uh, we're still on that journey. So it's not, a, to me, it doesn't seem like that scale is like suddenly huge. Uh, this size of project uh, uh, in terms of, it, it is perhaps a pioneering one, but this is going to expand. If we are going to tackle the problems that we have in the country, we better get used to working at larger scales. That's point number one. Point number two is yes, indeed, in some cases, you might want to have a master plan and, 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 and all the individual architects will work differently and, and do different things. And that often comes out of, out of a brief. For example, the Eastern waterfront in Mumbai that we are doing is basically a, is a plan, is, is a simple plan in which all the land parcels will be developed individually by different people. We are not, we are not working as architects. We are working as at best master planners or planners as urban planners. Uh, in the case of this sort of a project, the, there are actually nine buildings and uh, nine entities to this, to this whole project. Okay? Uh, one of them is the central secretariat. And the central secretariat is the large bulk of what is being built. The central secretariat, the desire is to create modular standardized offices where there is a lot of flexibility and that can all be managed well as a single entity. Now, that many buildings, uh, if, if every building is different, this whole idea of doing standardized modular offices that are managed well, that, are, that have a, a common infrastructure that lets them be ecologically sustainable, better sustainable, environmentally sustainable, that whole idea goes out the window. So I'm quite sure that buildings where 20, 30, 40,000 people are going to work, 50,000 people are going to work, a set of buildings like this, large housing projects, et cetera, are going to be, we're going to do many of these in the country. This is one such, if you want to put it that way. The second thing is, forget, forget about the logistics, forget about the functioning, forget about uh, the buildings as a whole. Uh, given the urban design scheme there, the buildings, of the uh, you know uh, the of the central secretary need to be muted they need to be in the background they need to be they they don't all need to be done by individual architects competing with each other to make their building special all of them are you know there are 51 ministries there are 16 grades of officers all of them function in very very similar ways they all, this is like a, 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 a very, very standardized set of offices in which people, sometimes some ministries will expand, some will decrease, you might create a new ministry, you don't need specialized buildings for each one of these. Okay? So to me, it's, it, from an urban design point of view, this needs to be a backdrop, this needs to be muted, this doesn't need to be shouting is one reason why you don't need to have uh, multiple architects doing this. The second is, that you need standardization, you need to do, you, 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 modularity and standardization is another reason why they all need to have a, have, be built to one design, okay? And, and I believe that that's, uh, that's perfectly fine in this case. Does this mean that always all such large projects must be done? No. In the case of, uh, of, of the Washington Mall, all of them are different museums dedicated to different things and can be different buildings and different architects. But in this case, they are buildings of a type. They are all standard issue ministry offices, in a sense. Huh? And the desire is to create standardized modular uh, offices uh, uh, where people so can, things can as be. A, as a corollary to what you're saying, that your design is quite similar to the uh, Lutian's master plan, particularly the aerial view that was published in the late 30s, but particularly in the way 
the ministry offices line up along the central vista axis now the, but the idea of building the central vista in the first place is to also a reflection of the i would say i mean it, it is a is a is the reflection of the politics of maybe british imperialism at that time and to show the might of the british empire to the people of india i agree with you that after independence that indians have taken over that space and made it their own but what um, what question i want to ask you is that what uh, apart from the philosophy from i agree with you on the urbanist logic of making a backdrop and all that but what political ideology is your design going to reflect how are you going to resist particularly in the the pressure to build a imperial or a triumphalist kind of vista as vista as it was originally in this as what is the why would you want to continue the uh, no, let me just finish why do you want to continue the lutians master plan and instead uh, maybe make the, the spaces which i have the offices part of them more open to the public from the central vista directly rather than be behind a compound wall nadesh uh, there two or three you 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 said two or three things huh first let us get let's get that imperial vision thing clarified and i don't see i i don't understand why uh, uh, why there's not been a you know better appreciation of this idea you see there's no doubt that the central vista was developed okay to be a symbol of the raj you were going to put the uh, the, the viceroy's palace as it was called originally on top of the hill to be seen from the entire city there was a bit of a fight about uh, between baker and lutians about whether the secretary of buildings the north and south blocks would be at the same level as the viceroy's palace or not and finally it was decided that the administration is equally important so the whole british raj was put on a pedestal up there uh, you know sort of overlooking the whole vista everybody below uh, you know that was the idea well we come independence and what we do is we take the the viceroy's uh, viceroy's uh, uh, palace the government house that it was called at that time um, uh, later called government house we take that and we uh, uh, turn it into rashtrapati bhavan the first citizens house so the people of india sort of get represented there instead of the instead of of, of the king uh, through the president but north and south block remain as the executive authority up there on top of the hill what is now being done is that the hill that that process of gradually uh, 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 turning this into a symbol of the people's power rather than of the government's power is being extended because what you're doing is taking north block south block prime minister office etc from there and putting it in the buildings below on the lower lands and turning those into museums so presently even now when we go there to the north and south block you stand outside north and south. You're, you're allowed to, you know you're allowed to go up up that hill and gape at this north and south block and everybody sort of mysterious looks at the at what mysterious things are going on inside and the mystic of power is sort of uh, in some sense uh, uh, remains uh, imagine that now you, people will be able to go up there take their children and go into north and south block and the whole hill now becomes representative of the people in a sense you have completely reversed the iconography of the raj you said on top is the people and the government is down below and and and, and, and now uh, you know i mean if there is anything being done the iconography of power is being being transformed here okay so i i don't see why uh, anyone would feel that this is the the raj being perpetuated now it is a much loved symbol everybody likes that that's the place that gets the maximum number of tourists this is the symbol of our government okay and and i, I you know people come there i mean there are people simpler than us so who, who 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 come there view the place they go to india gate they want to go up to parliament they want to go up there this is the sort of thing that people do on tourist trips like this and this is what will be possible to do now instead of you know come there and look at the the government on top of the hill you're going to be able to go up there and go down there and look at what's going on down below so it's pretty much in keeping it's pretty much in keeping with the gradual 
sort of deepening of the republic, if you want to call it. Uh, it's, it's, it's in fact uh, symbolically doing exactly what you would want to see there. Uh, the specific question on, okay, so what you're saying is um, the government is in agreement with this whole idea of power to the, the, give the places of power to the people literally, and they are in political consensus is there in understanding that. Uh, I've been told nothing that says it's not going to happen. North and South blocks have to become museums. I mean, that's in the master plan. I've, I've done presentations to that effect. No, I mean, yes, I specifically expressed that this is the right thing to do. Have the, has the government specifically told you that this is a great idea? This is, this is the... <laughs> Nobody says it's a great idea. I wish people were so open and, and encouraging about what you are trying to do. Uh, there are many people in government who don't think that's a good idea, but many people who think it's an okay idea. And uh, uh, up to now, the master plan is in place. I'm presenting it. I presented it. You know, the very first presentations of the master plan was done uh, with the minister and all the editors of all the all the major national papers uh, sitting there and all the institution heads like ISOLA and uh, IIA and IUDI and COA and everybody uh, presiding over that. This was five months ago and in this presentation I, I presented this. Uh, so, uh, so that is, you know, and, 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 and we are going ahead with designing, uh, you know, we have, nobody's told us to stop designing the PMO, uh, uh, where we have proposed it in the master plan. Nobody's told us to stop designing the central secretariat and the 51 ministries that, that includes the ministries which are presently in North and South Block. So I don't know what you mean by the question. Uh, tomorrow, if somebody comes and, uh, you know, says, okay, no, I, I, I want this to stay on top. Well, that will be tomorrow. It's not. So in that sense, I think, uh, uh, you know, all this, uh, all this idea of, uh, of this being uh, uh, done to project the, uh, the power of the government, I think is, 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 mis is misguided uh, criticism. Okay. So, so I, had a, I had a quick question to follow up that. You know, that I think Naresh's point, I think, uh, was about the imperial plan. And I think I'll come back to that. I'm um, sorry, I can't. If you look at the Latin's plan, there is a similarity that the offices have been laid out, perhaps. But when you talk about the DC mall plan, uh, how it has developed over time and how it has become a mix of this sort of bounded, secure uh, building. Okay, let me get to, let me get let me get to that. I understand what you okay. Sorry, finish, finish. Sorry. So I'm I'm wondering um, the master plan seems to give a place of privilege to something going on with audio. office building. Okay, so listen, listen. There is a bit of reallocation being done there. Okay. Vijay, Vijay, there is a problem with your. Vijay, there is a problem with your audio. And uh, other office. One thing. Okay, carry on then. I guess. Yeah, he's understood the question. I think. So, yeah. I think. I think I've understood. Let me just say, just uh, uh, Naresh asked the question of why these could not be more porous, uh, 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 and and uh, you're asking the question of why this uh, this area couldn't be. Uh, more public. Now, now there are the central secretary. Okay, sits there are there are. It sits on four plots. If you look at the plan, I, I'd urge you to uh, uh, see the, the 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 present the latest master plan presentation which I did for the Maharashtra Association Schools of Architecture, which was two weeks ago. Every month, I'm, uh, these are things that are getting revised as things become uh, yeah. better firmed up. Uh, you look at uh, this presentation, you'll see that the central secretary sits on four plots. Okay? Now those four plots, out of the four plots, three of them are already government offices in one way or the other. Okay? One of them has that whole array of Nirman Bhavan, etc. The other one has Shastri Bhavan, etc. That whole plot is full of office buildings. Second plot, full of office buildings at present. Okay? Uh, the third one has Vigyan Bhavan, Vice President's House and, uh, and the National Museum. Fifth one as IGNCA. Now the idea here is to it's a it's a hodgepodge of uses. I mean, vice president being there, a residential building being next to Vigyan Bhavan. It 
creates all sorts of issues. And uh, what's being done is that the uses are being reallocated. So the, so the hexagon becomes more a culture center. There are government offices there, which are being turned into IGNCA building, Hyderabad House across from that. There's another uh, already museum of uh, uh, NGMA is further down there. And there are other, the War Memorial Museum is to come up here. So various, that becomes a cultural hub at one end. On the other side, you have the North and South block, which is turned into a cultural hub. Connecting all of this is the gardens of the central, of, of the central Vista Avenue. Okay. Now just imagine that your culture, culture, ministry in the middle. Okay. You are not devoting more space than in any case, you're building inside what is presently fenced compounds. It's not, not, not building anything outside of it. Okay. So the iconography is getting a little better cleared up. And we have put there are as many people going to be in Central Vista as there are today. Not much more, maybe 5% more, but not much more because 10,000 people are being moved out of Central Vista. And the space that is created is in a sense to be used for more functions that need to be in the Central Vista. So I, I you know, it's not as if you are allocating more space for the Central Vista. You are you're using the same land that is being poorly used right now. Now, if you go to government offices, if you know, you've been to government offices and you give me the sense that these can be porous buildings in which people come in at the bottom level. I mean, where, it's not going to function. You look at the logic of how these, how the ministry offices work, they need limited access. You cannot have ministry offices that are fully accessible. You need parking, you need this, you need that. You think through, think through all of this and you will say, okay, it's in fact better to have good fence, say, okay, these are more secure areas. These are not accessible, but the rest of it is now therefore a lot more accessible. And that's, that's in a sense what we are trying to, trying to do through that plan. So um, it can't be porous buildings like this. Uh, you cannot create a mall below, below uh, government offices. It won't function. Uh, all sorts of logistical issues, all sorts of managerial issues, all sorts of, uh, you know, uh, access security related issues and you will not be able to do that. Uh, okay. There's a huge amount of security concern now. So if you have basements below uh, ministry offices, you, you are not going to do, uh, you're not going to make a place that is accessible. in the world. And mind you, in the US, what appears and, and other countries, what appears to be easily accessible is because all the secure, all the things that require high security have been put out of your reach in any case. Uh, you're completely, you know, and that's what makes the rest of the areas far more open. And that's what is being attempted here. Okay. I think Vijay, in the interest of time, can we go to the next question on the resource issues? Sure. Vijay, you have, you have to unmute yourself. So, um, can you hear me now? Yeah. 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 Okay, let's, um, a couple of things about the project, you know, it's a huge project, it's uh, in the middle of uh, New Delhi, um, 300 hectares. There's questions about why, whether we need this project at all. I mean, this, I think you've been asked before. The question is also, you know, given the times uh, where uh, the government is uh, probably strapped for finances, a 20,000 crore project at this moment, of course, we don't know how much it might become later. Is this project really, uh, is the right time for this project? Um, do you think uh, this would be? I'd, I'd, ask, I'd ask you the reverse. Am I the right person to ask this question? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not in a sense. Listen, I, am, I have a contract to design a project that my client thinks is necessary. I have personal views. I think it's necessary. Parliament needs to be expanded. Parliament needs to be improved. Uh, I, I don't know, uh, Naresh, have you been inside parliament? Yeah, yeah. And Vijay, you've been inside parliament. You probably yes, see it's it needs country. expansion. It needs improvement. It needs modernization. Okay. Uh, does government need a central secretary? Have you been inside the government offices? You've seen how people work. You will understand that these are investments. These are not 
uh, uh, expenses, revenue expenses. These are not subsidies. These are investments in infrastructure for better governance and for better uh, 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 administration, in a sense. Uh, these are facilities being created so that people might work more productively, more efficiently. These are also investments being made uh, so that the present uh, environmentally unsound uh, 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 you know, sort of office spaces with individual ACs and uh, 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 you know, lots, of, lots of technology that simply does not, that just guzzles up energy. Okay? Instead, if you build at scale, you build infrastructure together, you will save money over the long period of time. These are also investments where, uh, um, you know, uh, this government has stated that there are lots of rented properties that will be empty because you create this facility. So these are investments, point number one. So when you're thinking of whether to make some expenditure or not, you make a difference between what is, uh, what, what is uh, uh, investment and what is not. Uh, the second thing about this is that even in such strapped times, I mean, what we are talking about, and I'm, now I'm speaking not as, a, as the architect of the project, I'm just sitting in a, in a living room with you and talking about this as if we were both uh, uh, separate. Uh, you know, at one level, we are saying that government needs to stimulate the economy by doing spending, okay? And what better sector to spend it than on construction, which is job incent uh, intensive and which creates, so, you're saying give money to people, to businesses to be able to keep going. Well, in some sense, isn't this like that? Uh, so uh, listen, it's not up to me to decide whether this is right or wrong. And it's for a, all, all of us, it's, it's okay for all of us to have an opinion about whether it's right or wrong. Uh, uh, and, and what will be, will, will be, it's not my, my decision. But I'm just fleshing it out further and saying, listen, it sounds different when you think of it as investment and different when what if you portray it as vanity expenditure. Okay. And and it's not vanity expenditure. I mean, parliament will have to be fixed, as Nato Kal better faster than, than later. Okay. And if you any case have to stimulate the economy, what's this? You're creating you, you know, you 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 you're pumping money into the construction sector. So what what's different in this? Okay. You had a question also, Vijay, on the fast track nature of the project. Right? Yeah, I mean that that's uh, so. That, the thing is, now you read every day almost this project is so now so much in the imagination of the public that everything is being followed up and critiqued. You know, I'm sure. I mean, you you are also looking at that, and a couple of the things that uh, many architects have been saying uh, is that there seems to be a big hurry in in Going through this motion. You know, I, I didn't know when Indians started complaining about the fact that our government is too fast. Uh, you know, uh, listen, all of us, uh, you know, if at all, uh, if at all, uh, you know, uh, we, we need to get our act together and get things moving in this country. I mean, we don't want to say if something can be done fast, why should it be done slow? So maybe I, mean, not. I just don't understand it. If, 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 it's if, welcome, if, it's if, welcome in many things. Sorry. You know, no, one second, hold on. If if you are saying that it's being done fast at the cost of quality or at the cost of proper designing, I, I'm with you on it. It shouldn't be. And I'd be the first person to say it cannot be done this fast. Okay? But if it can be done, and if a challenge is put up to me, I'm quite willing to rise up to the challenge. I'm sure as designers, you're practicing architects. Haven't people come up to you and say, listen, I, have, I, I need this building ready by... March 31st next year. Mm -hmm. Why? Well, because I have this policy window that I have to make use of this, that, and the other. You look back and you say, well, is it doable or is it not doable? And if it is doable, you say, yeah, it's tough, but we'll do it. So it's in that nature that, that, that people come up to you and say, listen, I'd like this finished before 2022. It's an important date for us. Can we do it or not? Is it possible to do it or not? I say, listen, these are the things that will be needed. We can do it. I'm as interested in doing it uh, at high quality, but if it's doable, like a good professional, I'm going to support it in being doable. If, if it's not a doable, like a good professional, I'm going to say, listen, this is a call order. It's not going to work. Okay. So right. I, don't, I, don't see, I don't see why 
one should complain about a client wanting to do things fast. I think, Bimal, the more issue is that I think people think, I mean, at least it's the, the received wisdom today that the time that it takes to go create a project like this is automatically creates the checks and balances of the system. Speeding it up might disrupt that automatic check and balance model. And I mean, for instance, I just follow up that with the same saying that, you know, I, I'm just looking at this list. Uh, just now I got this list. More than there's a letter signed by 90 prominent citizens who are like completely opposed to this project completely and uh, what, what, your, what, what, what the government wants to do. These include maybe writers, their thinkers, their artists, and also some architects, quite a lot of architects actually. Why is there then, if what you're saying makes sense that this has been talked about for a long time, somebody has not put it into action, when the government is acting, why is there so much opposition to what you're doing? And you know, the, what does this teach us about the future process to follow for, as you were saying, these kind of public projects are going to go all over India now. This is just the tip of the tip of the iceberg. What is the process you think is ideal for creating these public projects? And uh, I mean, if you look at it, neither the Eiffel Tower or the Sagrada Familia or the maybe even the Statue of Liberty was created by a public competition and public consensus. Most of it has been done by the great monuments of the world. Many of them are patronage, starting with probably the oldest one with the Great Pyramid of Cheops or something. So you, do you think that it is a time or maybe the liberal policy of this age or what is it that is driving this need for large public consensus and large agreement before or do you think that you cannot really create great and iconic monuments using a consensus model? Because technically speaking, just to on the lighter side, if you follow the PWD rules precisely, you will also get PWD apartment blocks, which I don't think any of us want to live in, which is a triumph of process, but a failure of design. So do, what do you think? So, Naresh, you asked so many questions. I'm, I'm <laughs> saying it, but I think... You know, it's like, it's like oh my God, you know, where, where so do I start? Opposition? What do I talk about? No, no, what is the... Why is there so much opposition? So, first of all, first of all, first of all, uh, uh, this, is a, this is one of the most important sites in the country. Okay. This is an important project. It's a public project. Uh, in a democracy, if there were not discussion about this, that would be the big surprise. That would be something that we should be worried about. Not about the fact that there is so much interest and there is so much vigilance and there is so much wanting to work. So I, I am not one to, I, I'm not, you know, it's, it's, I see this as a positive rather than as a negative. Okay, that there is so many people wanting to write in, talk about this, do it, do it, et cetera, et cetera. Now that's, Having said that, let me say which public project in India is not being talked about in this way. Okay, let me take the Bombay Metro. Okay, you have you have so much, so many people writing in, trying to stall it, go to court, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. When the mill lands in Mumbai were to develop, all of Mumbai was active, trying to do something with it. It's in the nature of public projects and in a democracy that you would have. Lots of people interested, looking at it from their point of view, giving their, giving, you know, making their views uh, known, uh, using whatever tools they have to try and influence what is being done. That's a democracy. That's the vibrancy of democracy, and we shouldn't complain about it. Uh, and I don't complain about it at least. Okay, so that's point number one. Second, mind you, we go through each and everything that people are saying and writing about the projects. We don't not take it seriously. Please don't mistake it. We have each and everything, each and everything turned into bullet points about what it is precisely that people are complaining about or saying or this or that. The reason for that is pretty straightforward. I think that this sort of inputs, there are many things when you see it from different points of view, you really get to understand what is, what's, what, what, if there is a genuine problem and you want to know that genuine problem ahead of time, not later. Okay, so that's, uh, that, that's another reason why we, we take whatever is being said very seriously and scour it to find out things of substance that might help us improve what we are trying to do. 
so, and, 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 and you know, there is this documentary stuff. It also goes to the ministry, by the way, and ministry also looks at it. So it's not as if we are the only people looking at it. They're also looking at it to find out whether things of substance are being said, things that, that need to be addressed and taken care of. Um, so that's a, that's a second thing. The third thing I would say to you is, if you read the history of how the Central Vista was originally made, it was, it was as much debated and as much discussed. Uh, you know, the Grant book called, uh, book by Grant called uh, uh, Indian Summer. Read that. There was, I mean, you know, everything from the decision to, to make the Central Vista uh, or, or to make the capital in Delhi was contested by everybody in Calcutta. Okay. Then when the town planning committee was formed and said, we are going to select a site, then they, there was a huge, uh, you know, discussion and tug and pull about what the right site is. It took them a long time. Then when the architectural style had to be decided, there were some who felt it should be European, some who felt it should be, it should be completely Indian, some who felt it should be a mixture of the two, etc. And there was a big discussion about that. Then when Second World War came about, there was a big question about whether all this money being spent should be spent, not be spent. Uh, expenditure was stopped for a while, then again started. So projects like this are in the public realm are this is a part of that process, and, and, and I don't see a, a problem with it. Um, there are processes, there are, I mean, so the press and the people who write in now through social media, etc., that's one way in which feedback is collected. There's also structured processes for permission and for all sorts of things. Now, you said in an earlier question that perhaps things are being speeded up unnecessarily. You can't speed up a legally provided process. If it says you've got to keep it open for objection and suggestion for so many days, if that's what it says in the process, in the, in the books, you have to keep it open. You know very well. Nobody is going to do a project like this and bypass processes that have been provided for in the law. Okay. And it's going to be done, followed to the T. Because one thing that you know when you're doing public projects, I, mean, I don't need to say that, government officers know, that if you don't follow the process, that's the easiest way of, 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 of stopping your project. Okay? You go to court and you say process wasn't followed. Well, so you know, every process is being followed. We get, keep getting told that please ensure that you're following every process, every rule is being followed. Okay? Now, sometimes people end up saying, well, the outcome was not what I wanted and therefore start blaming the process. That's a natural tendency, uh, but that's not going to help. If you don't like the process, the process has to be fixed and in future that can be done. But presently, this is what the process is. So, you know, if the Supreme Court were to give a ruling and you don't like it, and then you start questioning the whole judicial system and saying that in any case, it's all been taken over and this and that and the other, that's a one story. Okay? And perhaps you need to fix that. I, I'm, I'm not saying no to that. But to say that processes are not being followed is to completely misguided and to not understand how these processes work. Now, I've said a lot. You asked many more things than, than, no, than the other what thing I, I said, you specifically but, uh, remind me of what else you asked. Me. The other part of the question was that, I mean, great, as I said, what is remembered as iconic structures of the world has not necessarily been created by a public consensus. It has been created by somebody with a vision and a, creating a, it's a patronage-oriented thing. Do you think that is the way forward? I mean, is no, that no, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I think that's to cast it in a, in a wrong sort of way. Let's put it this way. Can you see, uh, I have, once again, I've written about this in that LA journal issue also, because I think there's a big misunderstanding about what it means to live in a democracy. Okay. Now, when you, when you, when you live in a democracy, you, everybody's, uh, opinion counts, everybody has a right to voice their opinion. But we know that groups of people will never spontaneously come to a consensus about what is to be done. I'll forget about the fact whether that consensus is, uh, is, 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 is of, a, of a high quality, I mean, you know, it, it results in high quality building or poor quality building. Consensus never comes. Okay. If you think that consensus will spontaneously emerge if you discuss enough, then 
you're just uh, betraying a lack of understanding of how groups work. See, projects like this or any public project okay, requires you to think in terms of trade-offs. Uh, shall I go for this or shall I go for the other? Shall I value this more or shall I value this more? How do I get the right balance? Now, all of us are different people. We have different values and we don't all think that the trade or all don't come up and say that these are the correct trade-offs. It's precisely because some people will think these are mine. I, I prefer this trade-off. I'll prefer that trade-off. Somebody will say, no, my roadside shrine and traffic be damned. Another person will say, no, the traffic needs to flow smoothly. Please move your shrine a little bit. Uh, so on and so forth. Now, in such a case, you will get a log jam. Nothing will happen. So you have to create some this making some some mechanism for taking decisions. Now, so somebody will have to decide. It won't be all of you sit in a room, come to a consensus, and then we'll decide. Somebody will have to take a decision. Now, in a democracy, the people who are to take a decision are elected periodically for fixed periods of time. And we hand over to them the right to make those decisions. Okay. Now, every once in a while, you come upon a question that might require a general referendum. Or you might say that, no, hold this question till the next election because the election will be fought on this issue. Okay. That happens sometimes. No question about it. But those are really big issues. Okay. We are not talking about one project. Now, projects cannot be done with a referendum. If for all, for, for, for what it matters, uh, you know, our democracy has deepened, our democracy functions, we are proud of our democracy, it puts up people in power, those people in power take decisions, they work along with experts like you and me, or others in government, to come up with policies, come up with projects, for better for, or for worse, that's the system that we have. Okay. And that's what we are going to work with. And I, you know, for, as for me, I don't even, I, I, I'm, I, you know, you, my, my temperament, my, my approach has been uh, always, well, that's okay. So that's the system I've been born in. These are the duly elected people. I'm going to work with them. And I'll give you an example for that. You know, I mean, when, when I started off my career, I started off with wanting to do a street design. And, and, and then a, and a municipal corporation, a new municipal corporation um, uh, council had been formed. All of these were cooperators coming from, you know, these were not the elite, Ahmedabad elite of yours, who used to be mayors and be cooperators and things like that. These were simple people who had never heard of the idea of street design. And I started working with them. I mean, you have to work with the people who your democracy gives you. You cannot, you cannot, you cannot, you cannot delegitimize the whole process uh, and say, listen, I don't like the people and I don't want to work with them. That doesn't, that doesn't work. I mean, that's not professional in my view. So I don't know if I've answered your question, but I've sort of gone around it in a sense to say, listen, uh, right. listen, it's, it's, uh, let, me ask it, uh, let me ask it more directly. You know, also, what is happening is that, I mean, it's really no secret today that, you know, any architect in India would probably give him one arm and one leg as long as you let the other arm be alone to do this project. It's not the size of the project or it's not even the fee, probably. It's, it's not anything like that. It's probably the opportunity to create a leave a legacy. I think what real architects want to do is to also be remembered for what they did as a something like a contributing to nation building in some sense. Well, many are happy that the, for, I mean, we have already gone through enough of this uh, nightmarish uh, Amravati and uh, Raipur schemes from various people who don't seem to really understand the country very well. We're very happy that it's gone to somebody from India and with a capability uh, obviously in the background. But there is a huge uh, and growing criticism of environmental clearances, rush through land use changes. Many of the plots marked as semi-public and public has been moved to government with a simple notification. And even, you know, I mean, I know it's a subjective thing, but the aesthetics of the design itself, you know, people are calling into question, and I'm just being an echo chamber here, the previous experience and the building itself is saying that what have you done in the past which gives you the uh, uh, confidence that, you know, how which gives people the confidence that something extraordinary is going to emerge out of this. How do you deal with these kind of inputs? You said you listened to the 
echo chamber but i was listening to these kind of comments particularly on this environmental issues and these land use change which has gone through quite quickly in indian uh, government process usually it takes a long time to change any land use in this country so so i i think i've in some sense answered that question yeah, once more a bit but uh, your right. experience and all that also i think it's important to answer no let me let me let me answer that uh, you see uh, the 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 land use change there are two issues to it i see a lot of lot of talk about this land use change having been done you know one is one is about it going fast now i told you already earlier that that processes that are required have all been followed they have to be there's no 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 way that it's gone or, or the entire due process that is required for a land use change application has been followed uh, and if it has gone fast it's gone fast because somebody has pursued it and said okay let's not waste time but let's do what the law requires you to do that's point number 1 so i i don't think any environmental clearance any land use change etc has been done uh, in contravention you know what is required what amount of time deliberation etc time given for inputs none of this has been uh, has been sort of uh, uh, violated in any way it cannot be and that's uh, that's the fact of the matter but about i mean there's something there's some there, there's a sort of when i read some people talking about this land use change they talk about it as if there is some sort of a foul play involved here uh, you know that something that is uh, that that cannot be changed has been changed i i fail to understand this uh, and let me explain why um uh, you see uh, if you if you're a planner you will understand that land use is something is land use zones are zones that planners put up on a plan and say well this is what will get done here in their imagination whatever they believe x y z now all plans require a periodic relook at what is being done because all planners understand that these are not fast frozen things these are things that 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 you know because cities are not fast frozen entities uh, or you know economies are not societies are not technology is not fast frozen so whatever you thought of 10 years ago you might want to revise 10 years down the line and so there is always a provision for a relook at a plan or a revision of a plan in addition to this all plan all planning mechanism have some you know have some provision for an application for a land use change this might come from industry this might come from some uh, from a government agency it might come because of some transportation requirement revision revisions to land use change law provides for such revisions to be done why because planners know that these are not fast frozen things very often you need to change them now what the law says is that when an application like this comes apply your mind look at this and the same planner who earlier decided in a sense the same agency that earlier decided what is going to be is now going to take a new decision in light of the new facts that are presented before them and in light they all, these sort of revision applications also require for planners to go out and look at objections to this change suggestions to this change give time to people to write in then the planner has the authority to sit down and say listen i've i've heard this i've heard this i've heard that like a judge exercise their professional judgment and say i'm going to do x y z right thing that's the process there's some sanity to it uh, because because you can't take land i mean imagine a development plan of a city that's frozen for for 40 years i mean i i crazy the city is going to change everything is going to change we didn't have mobile phones earlier we didn't have metros earlier we didn't have anything earlier now all the calculations done earlier might want, might might change so i i don't see uh, you know i i see a lot of lot of uh, uh, displeasure with the outcome but i don't see the underpinning logic for why that is wrong so i i mean you know so environmental clearance well environmental clearance there's a process there's a huge amount of documentation you have to give every tree has to be measured every tree has to be numbered everything has to be done you have to propose what you are going to do people go through that carefully and give you a permission 
And then if you don't like the outcome, say, then you blame the process. This is, this is uh, uh, to my view, well, not much can be done about it. I can understand the sentiment behind it, but uh, not much can be directed. Can you also address that issue of that HCP's previous experience and its built legacy? Well, how, how, how is it prepared you for taking on a project of this magnitude? We have done, you know, uh, we've done a lot of public space projects. They, this actually, they, if you look at the project, Naresh and, and which are both of you are practicing architects, it's nine buildings okay. of X size. Okay. A lot of people have that sort of thing. Uh, have that sort of thing. I mean, Parliament is 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 uh, sixty-four thousand meters square of fifty fifty-eight or fifty thousand meters square building. I mean, what are we talking? Is, is it something that have we have we you know now if you're going to question me, Bimal, do you have the the wherewithal to design something like that? I, I, I think so. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, but I do think I can. I have considerable experience, etc. And maybe there are people who think that they could do it better. All architects think, you know, um, might might feel that they could do it better, this, that, and the other. Uh, okay. and, and I don't feel uncomfortable taking on this challenge. So I, I'm on, a, on, a, on a perhaps a lighter note, you know, you know, Gujaratis are known. The word Gujarati is uh, synonymous with the sharpest business people in this country. So the question really is that how much of an architect are you and how much of a businessman? And, I, and what I mean by that is, as a profession, do we need, a lot of us treat architecture as a calling, you know, as though we are like Jesuits or something like that, many of them. But really speaking, in the real terms, it is both a profession and a business. Do you feel it's important to be both a businessman and a professional to deliver significant impact as an architect in society? No, I, I, I think we should retain our sense of being professionals and we should not think of ourselves as being businessmen. Because businessmen are, 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 are you see, uh, 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 a professional uh, uh, is proud of the fact that it's our skills, it's our ability to do something ourselves uh, um, that, that, that is being called upon by other people. That's what, that's what, to, to, that's what sort of pushes us forward in a sense, wanting to do things, saying, listen, I'm skillful, I, I can do something. A doctor, a, a lawyer, I, I can persuade, a lawyer says I can persuade well and, and he loves the challenge of the, the or loves it to be called upon to tackle larger challenges every time. A doctor wants to do that with his, an architect wants to do or an urban designer wants to take on larger, bigger, more interesting challenges. And we have been doing a series of projects. I mean, you know, I'm, this is not the first project I'm doing in the public realm. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm sort of started quite early and I've been doing a series of projects, architecture, urban design, urban planning. And if, you know, if you take practice experience, so that's what, that's what pushes you forward, that desire to show your ability to solve a problem as a profession. And I think we should never forget that. But you know what, I think what you're saying really is that do we need to be good managers also? I don't mean business people, but good managers. And, and this I would agree um, um, that, uh, that we need to be good managers in the way, uh, if you, especially if you're, if you're running a, a firm or doing complex jobs that require large teams of people to come together. Uh, and, and many of these projects are like that. There are, you know, at, at, you know, at one stage for the parliament, there were 250 people working on its design. 31 consultants brought together to look at lighting and look at, uh, you know, air conditioning, look at uh, foundations and seismic safety and furniture and textiles and this and that and the other. So there's a diverse lot of people that has to come together to do this sort of a project. Uh, you have to provide leadership to that, which is another word for, 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 for management. Okay. So, so, so one of the tasks that a role that an architect, urban designer plays is that of being, of being able to manage large groups of people and make them work as a team. You might call it leadership ability. You might call it managerial ability. That's what you need. No, I don't. I don't. I don't think we should see ourselves as business people. We are not business people. Uh, if we want to do, if we want to be business people, we should do business uh, and not be professionals. 
and and i think of myself very much as a professional i don't think of myself as a business person you have to run sustainable firms but the level of profits that you make is not what is driving you on ultimately that's what drives drives on those sort of people but what you, what what's driving you on is being called upon to do bigger challenges okay and and or or or, or, or not always bigger challenges but some some people some temperaments are you know architects are not all the same some of them like to do you know dig deep and do sophisticated they they they're just doing small things but they're doing them better and better and sophisticated in some way uh, you know it's sort of their their mark their whole mark they're doing that all power to them that's what you need to do there are others who want to take on more and more complex and difficult and interesting challenges and that's their temperament and 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 it's it's good i think this whole world of architects is quite a big tent in which different sorts of people are required not everybody has to be uh, uh, of one type and that's that's really important to keep in mind but not business people good managers maybe good leadership skill maybe uh, but not business let me hand over back to vijay vijay what happened your video vanished yeah yeah there's some low bandwidth issues can you hear me yes i can i was trying to switch to another laptop but if you can hear me i think what's interesting is that you your practice is very collaborative because these projects are the way they are the nature of the projects needs people of different kinds to come together and you have to sort of provide the leadership and coordinate everything if you take two projects for example let's look at some uh, you know process uh, things let's say the amdabad river front and the kashi vishwanath you know has there been a difference in the way that you have handled them i mean your firm and the kind of uh, work that you do has there been a different style different process uh, in the way that you handled them uh um which how do i how you know yes and no uh both ways i think we bring uh, you know me and my colleagues bunch of people that we work together uh we bring a a problem solving approach to all these projects so in that sense they are similar to me these projects are not about uh, uh, uh putting an aesthetic stamp on it or a particular you know uh, uh, putting a particular style on something or they are not essentially about creating icons and they are we really approach the problem by trying to find out what's what that need to be solved here if you look at the presentations that i've done in the past about sabarmati river front now it says well 10 objectives that need to be solved you have we have the problem of no public realm we need to socialize uh, this uh, we need to create a public realm along the river we have a sewage going into the into the river we need to solve that problem there are slums and we need to figure out a way in which to so that issue we need parks and gardens in amdabad we need that issue we need to finance the project that's an issue we need we need flood protection that's an issue so we take we break a complex problem up of that sort into many i mean try to identify what is the problem that needs to be solved there if you take the kashi vishwanath project it's an altogether different set of problems there are, there are pilgrims here you got to make facilities for them you got to uh you know create an approach for them from the river up to up to the temple uh, the temple itself needs space you need all sorts of logistical facilities for people to keep their chapels in some place a uh, place for cooking the prasad place for housing the priests place for having an office for this so on so forth we try to take a functional problem solving approach and reduce the problem uh to to a set of those and then start putting it back together again now i believe that when you take that sort of approach every project is going to be in some sense different because you are tackling the problem of that place of that site of that uh, uh, you know what what's so the buildings of what, what we do in kashi vishwanath will be very different from what we do for central vista or what we do somewhere else it's not it's not like one style that i we, we want to place everywhere a one problem solving approach yeah perhaps so that's why yes and no yes we take a similar approach but the outcomes are almost always very different okay it's yeah. and it's precisely because that approach is of that sort that the outcomes are different 
So, but if you think about it, one of the key things I think uh, people have been uh, talking about is that these public projects, you're creating place for the people to do whatever they do in that particular context. Uh, you know, how, how would you engage with the people there? What is your process of engagement? I mean, okay. is, if it's, if it's an engagement over a time so that you can slowly understand, I mean, you're I'll, an outsider. I'll, 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 yeah. So, so listen. <laughs> Let's actually you, you take take a for each of the places we try and identify who are the stakeholders that we need to consult. The people is too broad a term. Okay, so we we try and break it up in, because eventually you got to meet somebody. So you got to say who is this person I got to meet. Okay, and uh, let's take Parliament for example. Okay, and Parliament has twenty five different types of stakeholders. There's the there's the Lok Sabha administration, which is different from the Rajya Sabha administration, which is different from the Rajya Sabha members, which is different from the Lok Sabha members. There's the security agencies. There are the you know the uh, the CPWD engineers who maintain the place. There's the the library staff. There's the catering staff. There's the guys who clean it up. They clean, and you know you want to get everybody to look at the design as it is evolving, and give you some objection suggestions to it. And, uh, you know, we have, we minute every meeting that we do and we come up, I mean, the design, eventually it succeeds if it meets everybody's different needs. Okay. And we've become quite good at, at doing this, having made some mistakes in the past of, 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 of you know, long in the past uh, of, of not having uh, understood the significance of this. Now, each of the projects as we go along has to be each of the projects in the Central Vista will be things that we take inputs from people. Okay? We don't set up a tent in the middle of the street and say, okay, now come. Maybe that's, uh, that has its value of some sort. But we, get, we try and identify as many stakeholders as we can. Now, important thing to remember about the Central Vista project is that it's not to be done in one go. Uh, these are, the parliament needs to start first because if, if it is on time, if it is to start first, uh, then that's the building that needs to be taken up first. And, and, and so whenever it gets taken, I mean, the sequence of things, it comes first. Okay. Um, the next will be the Central Vista Avenue, and then this, and then this, and then this, so, so on and so forth. So we've sequenced it all out. And as we go ahead, we try and get as many consultations. Now, sometimes these are private consultations. Sometimes these are public consultations with, uh, you know, uh, presenting them in, a, in a, a, and then hearing what the feedback is. Uh, some of them are structured consultations, uh, as in a land use change, uh, this thing, in the sense, bring in, bring in the suggestions in writing. Uh, that's what public projects are about. And, and, and firms that want to do this sort of work, we'll have to learn how to do it. And I think processes will improve as we go along, but quite a bit of it is being done to get as many. But you, have a, you have a strategy for this, let's say. Uh, Sorry? My, there's a strategy for how uh, you can you engage with the, with the stakeholders. My question is, how do you then slowly, being, being, being an urban designer and ha having done many such projects, what would an appropriate mechanism be that you can say, okay, you know, this could be a generally followed for public projects so that there would be a, at least a feeling from the other side uh, that um, people have asked questions to them. And I know in one of the projects that when we went and asked the vendors, they said, this is the first time somebody asked us anything about what we're doing. We're the ones in the market, but nobody asked us this, shove us away. And so they, that, that uh, sort of, understanding also of what their requirements uh, maybe you are going through uh, you know direct uh, uh, you know sort of interviews but in a larger group is there a mechanism that you would recommend that could be put in place for projects like this i i i, I don't have a ready answer for you uh, uh, but to say that yes the these processes that we use to get feedback could be better they could be less, uh, they could be more satisfying for people. 
And I think uh, uh, this will happen as we go along, as government also learns how to, how to, uh, you know, present things a little, uh, etc. So uh, um, these processes are necessary. We are taking in lots of input from a lot of people who are. But how do you get uh, members of the public to feel that they know about what's going on? Right. Now there are two things. Let me say. However good the process, uh, um, you know, it can fail if there is no trust. Okay, it can fail. However good the process uh, is, and wherever uh, processes like this work, there are two parts to it. It's not just the process. It's it's a general sense of trust that yeah, it must be doing getting done right instead of. No, I'm sure there's something foul here, you know. Uh, once you go with that attitude, whatever, I've been in consultation meetings on other projects, not talking about this project. I've been in consultation meetings on, on other projects. I mean, you're there with every blooming detail that you want to give. Uh, you want, you know, your construction drawings, if they want to take a look at it, you're willing to give them every calculation, but they've come with minds made up. If there's some foul play here. There's no winning people over. So I, I think you must understand that 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 it's not a it's not simply a question of how much you show, what you show, uh, which I believe must be done, must be done better. But you think because of that uh, you get uh, uh, you know smooth sailing? No. I, I have no doubt in my mind that it's got nothing to do with that. Uh, he, 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 that must be there. I'm not saying you shouldn't do it. Okay, so don't get me wrong. About it. You must do it. You must improve your methods to to show things to people. But there's no uh, no uh, convincing people who don't want to be convinced. We now need to, I think, in the interest of time, I think we need to move to the second part of the interview. Uh, right. Or the there second part. part. <laughs> and no, uh, I, before I do that, people, would you like to? Instead, we have been asking you all kinds of tricky questions. Would you like to ask? No, I don't know if this is the right time or place, but you know, I would you like to know, ask us anything because we are also fellow professionals. And no, I'm no, sure I, we go through see, a let me, lot of let issues me, like you are going through right now. See, let me, let me, let me, uh, you know, um, uh, on another occasion, if we had met, we would have talked as colleagues trying to push the agenda of uh, urban designers, architects working on public realm projects. A lot of us are like that. Okay, I, I know you've been trying to do it, and uh, Vijay, I don't uh, know you much, but I understand you're also trying to work on public health projects. And all of us are, are, are trying to sort of expand this area where professional, where government uses professional support to get a lot of, uh, tackle some of the most challenging issues that tackle us. And it's going to take some time for these things to fall into place, but I just wanted to know, uh, you know, what, what do you feel? How far have we come? Are we going to see some? Are we going to see some headway or? or yes, not? but I think we have to. If you start applying the rules of engaging with private clients, I think the mistake a lot of architects make is that when they engage with the public realm, they expect the clients in the public realm to behave like the clients in the private realm. But typically, okay. there's one guy taking all decisions, and there is no real. That, I mean, you get you you have a relationship in the private realm with a with a usually with a single decision maker. Even for large projects, there's one chairman or CEO saying do it. But people don't understand that working in the public realm means effectively you have to get used to the idea that there is no client like you in the private realm. The client is an amorphous mass which keeps getting transferred every now and then, also and also getting re-elected or not re-elected now and then. So the you have to understand to deal with that uncertainty. And many times where, not many times, I have not been super successful. I have, uh, as you said, I've been trying doing 20 projects, one or two, somehow scrapes through. So I've done a few. But what we find is that when there is a, what is that English word, probably the perfect storm, there's sometimes a confluence of the right idea, the right budget, the right project, and also the right civil society to support a project like that. When these four come together, the project happens. And we have to learn to also, what I would like to improve in this. And I think it's an important thing that more and more architects 
and in every talk that i have been giving in the past couple of years i have been requesting fellow architects just to start with their own street at least to start making a difference and not look at their realm ending at the compound wall or at the site boundary look at least at the street outside your building and don't just look at space between buildings not just the space inside the building lastly i think that uh, the point you raised about trust i think one more word is required you somehow you have to develop an empathetic response to a client organization when from particularly in the public realm that you you're not proposing ideas which are you're not coming up with processes and ideas which you're trying to transplant from the other sector that you're working in the more private space and learn instead to engage with the public realm in a much better way you know with all its deficiencies i think unless all of us get together who have got some experience in the public realm and change the way in which the government procures these services from us i think some reform is required there but i think we can talk about that at another time but it's time to if you want more architects to come into the public realm i think it's important to redefine the way the government engage we are all in the system for so long so we've learned to play that game of the system but we should start questioning the game itself whether the process can be improved and made better you know part of the problem there i think is also because the education is so this i maybe now things are changing education is disengaged from the public i mean especially architectural education not the graduate education if you actually are, a, are leading the team for a public project i mean how equipped are architects to actually negotiate with the the language of uh, conversation is itself sort of alien because many of the architects uh, you know they don't know the local language they can't sort of there's actually a loss to deal with the kind of uh, language that uh, ha- happens in the marketplace for example or at kashi vishwanath so you have to form a collaborative team that includes actually somebody you can communicate with and translate that for the architect because you are not equipped because your education going into education the education sadly leaves that part out and 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 so we should come uh, talk about that I, i always say that you know you need a mba after architecture a small course called mastering the business of architecture at least 6 months the people should be taught that before being let out i think it's time now for uh, vijay yeah, maybe Arish, some before, before, before you move on from there perhaps one day we should have a a a panel discussion about what it takes to do public projects yeah, okay, and, and you would you would uh, you MBA. know we should share our learnings on that correct that's, that's a good idea i think maybe it's time now for one or two audience questions before we move to the pedagogical component of this conversation yeah. vijay would you kindly uh, ask the question so so these questions uh, there are so many questions it's hard to sort of pinpoint which ones to take off but a lot of these questions have been sort of discussed in the conversation this one question i thought was standing out and it uh, is actually from prem chandavarkar um uh, he's uh, i just say the question the way it is because it's very well uh, you know is what is asking is as per the delhi development authority's notification published in the newspapers on changes of land use to implement the project over 80 acres of land has been removed from public semi public or district park usage and converted to government usage how does this gel with the public character of the project <laughs> see listen uh, this is this is word play more than this is this is not this this is this is what misguides and the the plots in which we are building the three plots which which in which we are building uh have on one side there is vigyan bhavan and there is a uh, uh, um, national museum and there is vice president's house some offices elsewhere are being changed from government offices to vice president's house the north and south blocks which are government offices are being changed into museum mm-hmm. okay and vigyan bhavan is going on to a plot which presently has government offices and this entire plot is becoming government offices okay so to say one side of the equation now development plans if 
any party you know has worked sufficiently would know uh, that they have these land use zones where it says listen this is to be used for some public purpose now vigyan bhavan public purpose the other side ignca public purpose i and another plot has government use very often these zones are, are put in there looking at what is already there okay and there is every i mean every planner understands that these are not fast frozen that you will change it forget the technical legalese of it look at the substance of it okay if you look at the substance of it you're building inside fence compounds which already have government offices where there is no public access take parliament for example right next to parliament is a plot for, which is meant to be for recreation technically on in the plan must have been put up as that some time ago what's in there just now okay presently in that is uh, 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 inside that is car parking is the reception offices is the barracks of the crpf there's nothing recreation about it. not even recreation for parliamentarians okay forget about people outside that's being turned into parliament on the other side is a plot which has what is called hutments government offices which is being turned into a green space in front of the pm i mean you know i'd i'd urge urge people to not 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 mislead others through using these sort of technical uh, and legalistic points but to look at the substance of what is being done everything is you know public space here is being expanded and we've said so in so many presentations in fact what's in the rashtrapati bhavan which is not accessible just now is a proposal to turn it into an arboretum the proposal to turn north and south block to seven into north and south block into museums and not accessible you don't want to pay any attention to that side of the equation you only want to pick up legalistic points and say plot next to parliament was for recreation is not for recreation never been for recreation it's it's being it's it 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 is just now fenced and the domain of the parliament in that a building is being built you know so i don't know what to say to that beyond beyond what i've said can i uh, ask another question from uh, pramod balakrishna sure sure please say hello to him also from me here is online so i'm just repeating it and just reading it out it's saying that uh, i have seen your design inputs for varanasi uh, development uh, sadly it just cleans up the present urban fabric and imposes on that vacuum created uh, imposes on the vacuum created an alien form into the fabric of an old city the edges of the design do not relate with the broken edges of the older city i do feel an appreciation sense of appreciation and scale was required but then somehow you implanted your regular language of your architecture onto a very very historic site what do you have to say to this from you know i could simply say um that uh, we should sit in front of the drawings once and talk about this because this is a subjective opinion about the solution that we have worked out for that area and uh um i believe that what we have done fits in with all the requirements that are there actually fits into that space quite well uh we should stand in front of a model that we have there and take a look at it the other thing i'd like to say is that if you walk around varanasi you will find a whole mosaic of different styles it's not one uniform style it sort of give you a sense of the space gives you a, a, a sense of that but uh, there are buildings of a variety of different styles put up there so this is a 50000 square meter area uh, in a vast city it's that much in that area a new language of architecture is being introduced which scale wise matches uh, and will use uh, varanasi has been doing that for years and years and years and 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 it, the the more important thing is about how this gels spatially with the rest the writing more on a palimpsest rather than a yes absolutely palimpsest. absolutely i mean i i'd recommend a book by uh, an american indian born american scholar that talks about see 
many of these buildings we see in Varanasi on the river front are no more than two, three hundred years old. And subsequently, so much has been built. And what the beauty of that place is at how it slowly takes all these various things. And so far, it's done to the same scale. And overall, right, it eventually becomes part of that palimpsest. So I think we'll move now to the uh, second part of it. I think we're running a little short of time, but we have another half an hour. So there was one more interesting question. I think Bimal would, would yeah. like to hear. I just Sorry. want to this one question, and then we'll take it forward. Yeah. This is from uh, Janardhan K. He's asking, "Do you think this? I think some of it has been answered, but let me. Do you think this project rather could have done been done in phases?" Well, I think he's referring to central. He's being done in phases. It's and not in one. Yeah, it's being done. That would have allowed for the user and the public to actually judge the success, failure of the project itself. It's because we are talking about something that is going to last for another hundred years. None of us had anticipated COVID-19. The change that you are anticipating in the North Block uh, and the South Block will be made open to public. May not happen. What if the government decides to keep it as it is? Is it a failure of the project then? I no. It's, whether it's a failure or not is not. I mean, it yeah. it it can be anybody's judgment. So I don't want to say anything about that. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, if it decides not to do that, it decides not to do that. I don't control that. And I think Naresh put it right rightly. If somebody thinks that government is one monolithic thing in which one fellow decides everything and everything that he wants or she wants gets done, that's also not not true. Um, so there is a possibility that things might change, things might evolve. Uh, you know, and, and things are being done in phases. Please understand, it's it, the central secretariat, given the requirements of having standardized modular offices cannot be done in bits and bits. Either you do it once and connect it all with an underground uh, people mover or you don't. So that has to be done at that scale. This is not a large scale project by world standards. Uh, you know, there are many projects this size, uh, individual buildings that might be of eventually add up to this much size of building other parts of the world, we better get used to doing things at this scale. It's not something. Uh, the, the other buildings are all in individual plots, vice president's residence, for example. I mean, you know, uh, it'll get done. IGNC will get done. These are bits and pieces, so they don't need to be, I mean, they're not interlinked in that. Absolute, they all happen to be in one area. They're all the, because you want to build central secretary, you will have to create a place for the vice president. So that by, by default becomes a part of this project. It's not that this is thought out as one grand, I mean, so many of the moves are of that sort. If you want to move national museum or ministry from here. Uh, so that's what it is. I, think I, I don't that, know if that fully answers, but. Uh, I think that we have uh, covered quite a lot of the aspects of know, the central vista as well as the nature of HCP's practice itself in other places. I think maybe it's time to look at Bimal's role, which is an equally important, if not even more important role as the director of the Center for Environmental Planning and Technology, CEPT as it is better known. And I would ask Vijay to, uh, I, I really cannot understand where Bimal finds the time to do this and run CEPT, but you know, some people have, maybe they don't sleep or something like that. I don't, I don't understand how. But then, Vijay, would you kick off the discussion? Yeah. Would you like a small two-minute break or something, Bimal? Or no, no I, I'm fine, but I'd like to answer your question about time. Yeah. How do you manage? Do you sleep? No, no, no. I do sleep. I sleep. Uh, um, I, I, I manage my time okay. I, I, there are two things to keep. For, with regard to SEP specifically, I started in 2012. And for almost six years, uh, seven years, 2019, until this project started, um, or, or, but to the first six years, I spent 60 to 70 percent of my time at set. Okay, I was physically there, and mentally, I was spending almost 90 percent of my time at set. So there was a period of time when I was focusing really on set. Uh, um, and and and, and um, in the last uh, year and a half, I'm, I'm paying much less attention, but much less is required, because I believe that uh, one of the key things that we have done is put. Uh, 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 you know, good systems in place, there are good people in place. And a lot of things are now being driven by, and there is lots of new things happening, but they're all driven by people at set. Now, I don't, I'm not, I don't have more hours than you, Gunaresh, I, I sleep quite 
quite well myself. I do this, Bill Gates. My, 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 if, if, I, if I were to take any, I mean, if I were to take credit for myself, I'd say I work well with people. I work well with uh, lots of different sorts of people. I, 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 I don't need them to be of one type. Uh, and I, instead, of, instead of finding out, you know, if there are, I keep saying to people, I say, you know, if there are five things and if, if, if on, you know, there's some people who will say, listen, I agree with you on this, I agree on this, I agree on this, I agree on this, I disagree on this, let's fight on what we disagree on. Uh, I'm not like that. I'm, I'm the other way around. Uh, I, you, we don't agree on all of this, but this we agree on, let's get on and work on it. And let's see if we can expand that agreement to being two or three more areas. And, and, and I believe that because of that approach and attitude, I end up working with all sorts of people and eventually they do the stuff. I'm, 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 I'm providing leadership and maybe a vision and a thought process and something. But you know, I, I, I work with wonderful people, both at SEPT and at SCP and, and that's, that's really the trick to do it. <laughs> this you had a question about the changes at SEPT, right? Yeah, yeah, I think, see, the thing is, what we have heard, I mean, I'm in Bangalore, so long distance away, and you hear a lot of things, and I'm from SPA, and uh, so uh, there is actually this conversation about SEPT having a lot of changes happening, uh, big change of guard, since you came, I mean, to more interest. And some of the major, major changes have happened, like you already answered part of the question in leadership and management, and, and of course, pedagogy. So what really are the changes? I mean, it's a mystery to a lot of us. Uh, so what so, really are the changes that have happened to you to go? What have you initiated? So, uh, you know, um, this, this requires a, uh, a whole session also. <laughs> but nonetheless, let me just quickly try and summarize. You see, Sepp, when I joined it in 2012, I was already a 50-year-old uh, 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 institute, organization. I uh, started off very small. When I was a student at SEP myself, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, I'd be 20 years after it started, um, I, it was a school, uh, the School of Architects, 150 people. There are 30 people taken in, in, in one batch in five years, so 150 students. Uh, one badge gone for training. So we were very, very tiny organization. Maybe there was a planning school and totally there were 200 people. Okay, and uh, um, so it, over the 50 years, particularly in the last 10 of those 50 years, 10 years before I joined, it had expanded, it had grown, but without any commensurate changes uh, uh, in, in, its, in the way it functioned. And, you know, and in some sense, uh, after 50 years, it had done well. It was, uh, uh, it needed a relook, a reimagining, a rethinking out of everything about the Institute for it to get ready for the next 50 years. And that indeed was the management, uh, the, the board of management's uh, mandate saying, take a look at everything here from uh, the focus of the Institute to its pedagogy, to its infrastructure, to its uh, financing system, to everything. And make the changes that are necessary for it to get ready for the coming sort of future. Okay, so that was, that was sort of a very, very broad mandate. And indeed over the first seven years, we put in, we transformed a lot of things. I think SEPT had many strong traditions, many good people, many good sort of things that were good, but there were many aspects of it which were really, really, really problematic, truly problematic one, and, 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 and having not been addressed, there would have been a problem. So the first thing we did was we decided to focus. It had started growing into areas that were not its business, okay? So we had to close down some programs and say, listen, we're going to be focused on habitat issue. That was a bit of a hard burn for some people, but, but you know, we are not going to start suddenly an art school uh, here, and, and we're not going to start a technology management school here. Uh, we're, we're in the business of, of, of habitat-related professions, so let's focus. So first, bringing that focus. Second, we had to create an organizational structure. There wasn't one. There were 12 faculties created, and some faculties had no program, no teachers, nothing. They were just website names, uh, and titles of a few people, et cetera, et cetera, that sort of 
unwieldy structure, no roles and responsibilities are clear, nobody knows who's reporting to whom. And you know, when you have an organization like that, uh, uh, it operates very poorly. Everybody is, is sort of, they, there's lots, it vitiates the atmosphere, it doesn't function well. So roles and responsibilities are defined, organization structure had to be clarified, and uh, this took a lot of doing. So we all, you know, basically sat down together and said, listen, how are we, how are we going to do it? It used to, you know, for men, so, so those are the sort of organizational managerial things. Uh, I'll not get into everything, but you know, then there was the other side where, let's take teaching, for example, or, or pedagogy. I mean, this is really important. One thing that had been, uh, one thing that had happened over a period of last the 10 years before I joined was that somehow uh, uh, the Institute had become far more interested in, in, in building the, or, 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 or forming or, or molding the, the, the values and prof, uh, political values and uh, you know, sort of tastes and preferences of, of students than actually building abilities. Uh, you know, uh, when I was a student at SEP, uh, everybody who was teaching was a professional and uh, uh, you, 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 there was a lot of focus on saying, okay, I don't care in which direction you are going, but I'll give you the tools with which to go in that direction was a sort of uh, a little more of an more of an attitude. Building abilities of, of our students had, had sort of gone down. And so this idea that students uh, talk their way out of problems instead of designing their way out of problems, uh, you know, so, so, so that had to be addressed and we had to bring focus back on ability. So we created a whole foundation program uh, uh, where we put all the students of architecture, design planning, uh, everybody together in the first year, because that's when you grab them, that's when you build skills. That's when you form the habits, then that's where you form. So that has worked out marvelously. We did a show about the foundation program in Chennai. Uh, uh, it was to be done in Pune, it didn't. Uh, so all the work of the foundation students. So that was another change. Uh, the student body had become provincial because uh, somehow nobody had paid attention to the fact that slowly government policies had dictated that only students from Gujarat would be admitted. So you go to the hall there, and after the undergraduate body, uh, you know, 180 students admitted at that time or whatever was there. I mean, there'd be 10, 15 from the rest outside Gujarat, and most of them would be from Ahmedabad. How could how could you run an institute like that? Now that meant giving up a small government grant we were getting and getting the government to agree that we would be allowed to get students from outside. Now we are back to having uh, a, a cosmopolitan student body instead of having a provincial student body. So now 50% of our students come from across the country and that, and when I studied at SEP, it was like that. Uh, that's how I know, well, Pramod, if you are there, uh, uh, you know, that, that's how I know people like that all across the country, you know, who came together to Ahmedabad. And now it's become back like that. So that was another area in which we were paying sort of, uh, we had to say, change government policies. We had to change uh, the, it's the scale of teaching. And that I don't think most people across the country have paid attention to. You see, the point is, you might have an intake class of 80, but you can't run a studio for 80 people. You can't even run it for 40 people there, okay? Really good studio units operate with 12, 15 people uh, in the studio unit. So how do you run a 12, 15 period studio unit? So we have changed the whole system so that uh, we have a studio unit system. If you're aware of it, this is the system that British schools use, uh, 10, 15 students, each teacher teaching. So I'll tell you across the board, you name it, we have, uh, you know, we've done something or the other to improve. Uh, most importantly, most importantly, and I, I, I'll end with that, uh, the feedback systems, okay? No institution functions without good feedback systems and which are well put well into place. And student feedback. In IIM, students give feedback on their teachers and that's put on the website. That's why that institution, uh, you know, that feedback is really important for management, for teachers themselves and for the students. So we have a, we built a feedback system like that. But most importantly, uh, one of the things we said at, at, at SEP was, um, this was three, four years ago, we said, uh, listen, the only thing you look at to judge the quality of a school is the work that students do. Nothing else matters, okay? Doesn't matter who the teachers are, doesn't matter what they're doing in their professional lives, it doesn't matter what your infrastructure is like, it doesn't matter what the quality of uh, you know, your library is, etc. 
finally, if you want to see what the school is doing, what you have to check out is what the students are producing. That's like, a, like an exam at the end of an IIT term, you know. Uh, the exam tells you uh, what the students have learned. In our case, what they have produced tells you what. So we have a system now where at the end of every semester, all the student work is displayed and reviewed by a board of review. And we have reviewers from across the country who are not connected with SEP directly, don't teach there, okay, necessarily. These are professionals. They come in every semester. We just finished our board of review for last semester, which half of it was online. And, and they come in, look at all the work, and they turn in a report saying how each of the studio units is doing. And believe me, when the teachers come in and look at this feedback, it's extremely useful. I mean, both to give them constructive criticism, to encourage them, you're doing really good. The board of review is telling you're doing fantastic job. Uh, maybe you could change this. So these sort of review mechanisms never existed. We just kept patting ourselves on the back and saying we're terrific. You know, there was no outsider coming and telling you whether you're bad or good or ugly, you know, so these sort of systems to put in place. So what we were doing was, well, you know, I, I've studied five years in California after I studied at SEP. And, you know, that's a, that's a Sarkari, Sarkari college that had 14 Nobel laureates. There are many systems that we, that we saw there, many systems that me and my colleagues at SEP went to London. We go 20 people together every summer. We go to, to London to see the student work there. Many things we learn from there, we indigenize and try and put in here. Many things we have our own. You know, we, we eventually want to say that SEPT has to function so that our show should compete with the shows in any part of the world. You know, it's not, our student show, our student work show at the end of the year, I mean, that should be equivalent to anything we see in the world. And how do you, how do you bring focus back on excellence? And how do you create systems whereby excellence is, uh, is achieved? Okay. So what we have done at SEPT is essentially put in all the systems that you need and all the processes that you need to ratchet up slowly the level of excellence. It, it, remains, it remains an institution with a lot of diversity, lots of people. Now, now there are far more people coming in and teaching than earlier. Once again, remember, we do, when we were calling somebody to teach, we said, oh, look at his work or her work outside in the professional world. Look at what their students produce. If their work outside is uninspiring, but if their students produce inspiring work, that's the person for self. It doesn't matter what Bimal is doing outside or inside or wherever. It's what the students are doing. So it's this. You can see I'm, I'm full of this. Huh? Oh, sorry for taking so much time. Let me just, uh, let me just take you from there to a slightly... Variant question. Currently, you have, as we have already pointed out, that you're already doing some of the biggest urban design projects in the country. And we also noticed that there are many colleges in Bank India which are now do, offering a master's degree in urban design as well as uh, planning uh, subjects. Uh, I have two points here. One is, do you feel that India has a critical mass of uh, people that is uh, accredited professionals deal more and more with these kind of projects. For instance, how many of your members in HCP itself, the key members of your in, uh, firm, are they educated outside this country for, and they bring back this knowledge to India to use here? And overall, what needs to change in architecture, urban design and planning education in India to make this expertise and intelligence available locally instead of depending on bringing it from somewhere else? <laughs> Naresh, once again, I mean, you, you know, I have two questions. Two you know, one session, there's three sessions in there. Two questions. <laughs> but Just listen, let's, let's, start with the, let's start with the smaller ones. Do we, you know, how your people in your firm are educated locally and how many of them have learned what they have learned abroad, not here? A lot of the key people are, have, have, have one way or the other, either educated abroad, have experience abroad, some of our some of our director level people have, uh, you know, they're, they're basically 20, 25 years in the abroad. Come back. Indian, Indian background, Indian origin, worked here 10, 15 years also. So it's, it's important. I'll tell you why, and you know why it's, why, why, why it's important. It's not so much the education always, uh, but it's also an exposure to how things are done in other places, other places where they are successful. 
Okay. So for example, if you are setting up a metro system, it's, it's nice to have been to a, you know, even in architecture projects, if you're going to design an airport, it's nice to, nice for the people who are, who are designing the airport to have uh, 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 traveled yeah. in international airports and seen this airport and that airport and be able to compare airports and things like that. So if you're going to do public space projects, you want, you, you know, you want people who have been, been abroad and seen stuff uh, not necessarily to entirely copy what what is there, but it expands the imagination, and you know how that works. Uh, so, so yes, indeed, I think it's extremely important. Uh, remind me to tell you something about what we are doing at CEPT after that. Uh, so, at HCP, there was a time, perhaps uh, seven, eight, ten years ago, where I was I was sort of wanting to do all these public space projects, and I was finding that, uh, you know, there was simply not enough critical mass of people. Uh, with master's degree from abroad or having some foreign exposure, et cetera, who I could build as part of my team. And HCP at that point of time had the policy of sending people out to study for two years to Berkeley, to Delft, to, to London, to places like that. So with a commitment to come back and work for five or seven years, that sort of uh, commitment. Some of them end up working for longer and some of them uh, for, you know, finish their commitment and go on and set up practices of their own. So we were, we were actually building up, and, and my aim in, in supporting uh, 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 colleagues in going and doing master's program, and the office paid for it, uh, was because I needed colleagues with me who would be able to you know, have that sort, sort of uh, uh, an exposure. We also spend a lot of money sending people abroad for travel, uh, to just go and see things, to go around. You know, I remember a, a very dear, dear colleague of mine uh, telling me, we, 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 this was, this must have been 15 years ago. And we were talking, you know, this right up early days, 95, 95 onwards, uh, around the year 2000. And this colleague just turns to me and says, Bimal, you know, we keep talking about good cities, but I've never seen it in my life. I've never been to a city in which what you talk about, uh, you know, ordinary people have comfortable lives and, and flourishing lives. I've, I've never seen a place. And it struck me and I said, I said, this is crazy. I'm trying to, I'm trying to work with colleagues. And I, I, you know, at that time, that must have been year two, I, I put 75,000 rupees in his hand and I said, go, travel and, and, and come back, you know. And, and, and then that person worked along with me. So I think it's really important. Now, what are we doing at CEPT for that sort of thing? Okay, so I, I you know, I, I think uh, last year we decided, like all the design people at CEPT, Every June, not this time because of the Corona crisis, but for three years, the a whole lot of design tutors get together, and uh, people working at CEP get together, and we go to London uh, in June to see the the, the exhibit year-end exhibition of all the schools in London. All the schools in London in the last week of June or first week of June, sometime, put up their exhibition, all their student work exhibition becomes their architecture festival week. And it's a great time to go. I'd, I'd urge you to go and see. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so that's the time at which you go. So we got 20 people. We decided we'd take all the planning people, all the people involved in urban design planning. We said, okay, so everybody needs to go and see Southeast Asian cities. You need to go and see Hong Kong. You need to go and see this. You know, you're, you're not going to see different parts of the world. It's going to be very difficult for you to, uh, you know, uh, imagine other possibilities. Uh, and it's not to copy, please understand. It's not a copy, it's a, it's a mind expansion program, a liberal arts program, an architect learns by traveling, you know. And so uh, at, uh, finally, except we decided what the hell, it's not just teachers. Huh? So we said that the whole batch of urban planning postgraduate students, 150 students who join for urban design, urban planning, at the end of so first semester, they'll have a foundation semester in which they will analyze a portion of Ahmedabad to death. And, and draw it up in different ways, analyze it, et cetera, et cetera, and learn how to, how to talk about it like urbanists do. Uh, then all 150 students will go off for two weeks. And at that time, we wanted to send them off to Hong Kong. So all of them go to Hong Kong because that will be the most disorienting program for them to be able to go and see something that is so unfamiliar in some ways and, and to get to get, get a sense. Yep, these are students who are from 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 simple background sometimes, and, and, and it's important for them to see what the world is like, not just hear about it uh, from other people, see it on TV, see it in movies, books, etc. 
uh, we couldn't send them to Hong Kong, so uh, we diverted the program and went off to Kuala Lumpur. Uh, the important thing is not Kuala Lumpur, it's not Hong Kong, it's, it's to go out of your environment, go to another sort of environment. All 150 people went. And, and, and it's a mind expansion program for all the students. Okay, so that's the sort of uh, things we we'll, uh, that these are the kind of things we need to do if we are to tackle the complex challenges that our country faces because many of the challenges other people in the world have faced. They've come up with their solutions. We are going to have to come up with ours. It just makes sense like you and me. To be shared yeah. with other schools which are teaching these master's programs because I get a lot of urban design graduates from other colleges coming in. Many colleges have started this and many of them are just being taught out of a textbook. I mean, Vijay is actually undergoing a big problem right now because they're not even able to go to a local site, forget about going to another country. So, but I think maybe a lot of these uh, issues that you have brought up should be shared with at least the master's level program in India needs as much reform probably as the undergraduate and particularly focused on creating people what I would call a master's in urban practice, not just in urban thought. I mean, you can keep on theorizing. We are thinking of a program that would do something like that. But let me say something, something else. You see, uh, one of the things we have to learn, we, 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 we have to tell ourselves, accept and remind ourselves is that you cannot get practice ready professionals at the end of an academic program. No professional, no professional in the world is trained only in a school. Okay? You can't get practice ready professionals straight away. Uh, all professions require, require a period of apprenticeship. Uh, I think you should, going, according to me, you should institutionalize that in architectural education. In all, world over, no professional architect is allowed to call himself an architect with just an academic. Two, three years of and a viva voce after that. So, so yes, so what we what we told ourselves at SEP and when we were organizing all the different programs, so please remember, uh, we are creating apprenticeship ready professionals. We are not creating practice ready. I and think we, that answers your next question, no, is it? I mean, yeah, yeah. I think it's a, it's he's already answering that. I think please go on. Yeah. So, so in that sense, what I'd say is that you you. you school programs and remember you can't teach something in a practice that you can teach in a school uh, you know school will allow you uh, skill building of of, of a kind uh, 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 exploration of a kind that you cannot do in practice or practice uh, working with a practicing professional and learning from that profession is of a, of, of huge amount of importance uh, so, uh, so I think, uh, you know, getting our profession ready to tackle the kind of challenges that we have is not only improving the schools, but creating good quality mentorship from professional firms, you know, and, 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 and institutionalizing that process, as you are saying, and ensuring that, uh, so for that also, I'm both at HCP, I mean, at HCP, definitely we have, we have a lot of interns, uh, and, and at, at one level, all of us run schools. Uh, you know, the people who come in for a year or two years, and you, we keep telling our students that, listen, uh, find out a place where you can learn. That first job is not about, you know, you're not an IIM graduate looking for the highest salary. Those are different fields and different sectors, etc. Find a place where you can, yeah, you must pay, you must pay apprentice as well. And that I don't say no to. But from an apprentice point of view, what you should be most concerned about is going to a practice where you can learn things, where you will get an opportunity to. So if you're interested in urban practice, that's what you have to do. But there is a possibility of creating a master's urban practice type of a course. We're thinking about doing something like that, except what more about that later. I, I, I want to now uh, move away a little bit from SEPT. I think you have articulated clearly where SEPT is going. and. Maybe the only good the, the good suggestion is to how to also disseminate this knowledge to other colleges teaching these kind of courses so learning can be a little speeded up. You have also been a member of the Council of Architecture for a long time, a controversial body, which keeps getting into controversies all the time. What do you uh, can you tell us what you have been doing in the Council of Architecture? And also, I want an opinion from you whether why should um, world over. The, the one organization does not uh, regulate both the and uh, most of the countries in the world, with some exceptions. 
a separate organization controls the architectural registration board and the educational component and another organization controls the professional practice why is it do you think it's time to split the two and create two separate organizations i don't see the indian institute of architects having a role in either they seem to be more representative of the concerns of architects rather than set, uh, setting the even bangladesh for instance the institute of architecture is the one which controls the education and there is a separate body controlling the so do you think it's time to change that and can you tell us what you have been doing in the council as a member from gujarat all these years as a member of you know all the council whatever council meetings are there whatever obligatory work that has to be done as a member i'm doing i'm not doing beyond that whenever i'm called to do that i i think the present president is is striving hard to try and a lot of new blood there right now sir. yeah the present president is striving to uh, uh, to 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 modernize and change things uh, and, and so whenever i'm called on to do that i'll i'll, I'll play a supportive uh, role for doing that uh, uh, with regard to the regulatory issue you know i think uh, we need to take a lot more liberal uh, uh, attitude to regulating education the you know the real problem with our regulatory systems is we regulate inputs and no outputs it's like saying you will regulate how much cement sand steel goes into concrete but you will not measure the strength of the concrete after it is cast uh, you know uh, actually you should do the reverse you should say please schools you can teach in whatever way you like finally i'm going to do an exam and you pass that exam and then i'm okay you might have some rudimentary simple regulation of the schools uh, for consumer a protection point of view um, but you don't really try to tell the schools exactly what to do uh, you know and and we have like everywhere like we are talking about rules we have we have we have, we have quite uh, uh, difficult <laughs> to follow rules uh, for education also i remember going to a council uh, supervision once many years ago 10 years to go to a bombay school and the council requiring that school to have 5 acres of land in the middle of middle of mumbai i mean come along you must be joking how can you you know you just basically saying i don't want a school in bombay uh, uh, you know that sort of thing so you don't need to regulate inputs you need to regulate outputs you need to have an exam at the end uh, that will uh, that will uh, uh, somehow uh, uh, check uh, the professional abilities that the, that an architect is supposed to have and and that becomes the entry point into regulating the profession uh, even the profession when you regulate all our rules were formed in 1970s when india was a different place altogether uh, when the economy was different the, the you know the whole whole, whole ideology was different uh, uh, and, and and what we need really is we need uh, to 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 transform these rules so that they make sense for the profession so that uh, uh, you know so that all of us uh, uh, find that and our clients find the rules that we are supposed to follow as something that they would uphold also uh, you know uh, i i don't think we can do things that just uh, good for the profession but we have to think 360 degrees so so from the government point of view from the marketplace point of view from the professionals point of view uh, what makes sense as the rules by which our profession must work and that's what i think kind of transformation that's needed whether we need two bodies and separation well i I don't know. I'm given that much thought to it, Nareesh. To be to be honest. All right. Um, I think Vijay has dropped off the call, so I'll just continue from here onwards. Saying that. Um, no, he's back. No, I'm here. I'm here. Uh, go ahead, uh, Vijay. You're. Uh, you also had some question about the whether yeah, the yeah. structure of education itself must is changing. Right? So, yeah, I, I guess it's not only SEP, but I guess world over education seems to be slowly changing. this seems to be a new kind of marketplace for education where you can go and take courses which are not really serious yet they're not in that league where they really make a difference to the programs but they will i mean you can see that the future is changing that sense almost as if they, they you could do your own cluster of uh, programs and make yourself an architect i mean it probably in some point of time it might reach there in fact i'm an architect no i'm going to talk to someone who has a, a, a the first at least online masters degree in architecture completely online and i was talking to them as to what this does it make sense that's for practitioners to be doing along with their practice the new practice and they study and it seems to make sense so i can see there's a lot of change that's happening uh, 
Um, so how do you think the formal structure of education is changing or should be changing? Will it change because of the growing marketplace of colleges and online courses or because of education policies? What do you think? Well, a simple answer to that is, is both. I think we are going to see a change in the regulatory system. The new education policy is going to come in uh, whenever it does. It's been promised for a long period of time. Uh, there is going to be a change in the way that the profession is regulated. We're talking about that in next. So, so government, I mean, it'd be foolish to, uh, I mean, not foolish, but you know, obviously regulations and the way they are structured are going to, uh, um, are going to affect the way in which education works. There's no question about it. But there's also the other side, which was not there earlier, which is the whole, uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, the marketplace of education, as you're calling it, uh, the pressures that come about because uh, um, because of the the competition between schools, in a sense, right. and competition between alternative ways of running schools, like apprenticeship-based master's programs, or or which, which already, you know, for example, in London, there are schools that are doing that and, and various other places also. Uh, so, so, so the, you know, there's a, there's a competition between schools to try and figure out how they can do uh, better training at, uh, you know, from the, from the point of view of the student. Uh, and that competition is bound to also change the way we run our schools, uh, which I think is also a good idea. So far as at the end of it, uh, you have uh, some way to measure what has been achieved by that program. Uh, and the profession, in a sense, requires some entry barriers that are not, not sort of determining how the education system should be, what the curriculum should be, what the, you know, everything should be, but regulating at, at one point and say, okay, you have an exit exam, uh, saying that this is what, or, or, or you might say entry exam into the profession. Uh, and, and that's, so I, I'm more in, generally speaking, more in favor of that. But I think both things are going to work. The market marketplace, the rivalry between schools and colleges and programs and providers of, is going to have a, I, I think in general, a positive impact, nothing much to be gained from uh, from a lack of competition. Competition always forces innovation, forces change, forces us to re-examine what we are trying to do. Uh, and uh, you know, when I went to SEP, there were eight schools in the country, each of them with a 30 student intake or something like that. I mean, that was uh, uh, that was a recipe for complacency. Uh, you know, and, and in some sense, the burgeoning of uh, the number of schools as a problem but also is, is a great wake up call for everybody who thinks that they can just sit back and do what they're doing. So, so maybe yeah. Seth, will SEP be open to offering uh, and sharing its history program with say colleges and- uh, Absolutely, wherever. absolutely. There's no question. That is why these, you see, we, the, the, we, we think that one big innovation is the foundation program. And so we went uh, to Chennai, did an exhibition of what the program is about. And in fact, we are creating fellowship programs so that people can join as fellows at SEPT and help teach in that program, take those ideas back uh, if they want to. Uh, also, some sort of workshops for teacher training. Um, all of that, uh, we, are, we are, you know, very much, the people at SEPT who are now taking those agendas forward. Hey, just I think one small heads up here. I think Gita, we're running out of time. So ten minutes beyond the one o'clock. So that's fine. We we, we are good. Yes. If all I just have one. I think there are the last two questions now. I think the a direct question to Bimal here at this point is that um, I think he has answered the question of uh, there was a question earlier about you know the uh, most of the faculty of uh, SEP being from uh, they're your own alumni and uh, but there was also an issue that the school had become very provincial. I think what is happening to the loss of the provincialism, obviously, I hope is also happening to the diversity of faculty. And now with everything online, I don't think you need teachers from Ahmedabad to teach in Ahmedabad. Teachers can be from anywhere. We have to uh, you know, grab this model of a hybrid education model where part of the staff is physically present and part of the staff is now electronic. We have all learned 
after this uh, tamasha for the first few days that online has actually much more depth than we gave it credit for so i'll come to this question uh, maybe a, a last question before we ask you a couple of uh, audience questions and close this session with uh, uh, okay let me get to it straight how much of a politician are you bimal would you accept a rajya sabha nomination where it were offered to you in future and maybe beyond that what about a minister maybe you are doing six or seven of the largest urban development projects in the country would you consider being the minister for urban development for india if it was offered to you you <laughs> <laughs> know that's fun but you know no, it's you... not a fun man would i happy you... you know just ministership no would you be a nomination you know i have been to i've been to that uh, that building on the hill yeah nice place yeah okay i'm joking huh baba so many people twist my words around uh, let me make clear i'm joking but yeah if there is something uh, something higher than that maybe <laughs> okay no, i'm 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 happy not being a rajya sabha member i'm happy not being a minister uh, I, i'm already doing a lot And, and and i'm quite enjoying it so i'm quite happy no architects are, i don't see any architect of pillu modi entering the halls of parliament to change the system arrange we we'll leave that open for you no no don't leave <laughs> if it is offered to you would you say yes it's a direct question no i'll say no at this point no okay uh, <laughs> vijay would would like to take a couple of uh, student questions there are a couple of I thought we'll end with the student questions, and I think Vijay, could you articulate one or two, two or three of the issues that were brought up by students during this whole process? I need, I need some help. I've not gone to the chat box. Geeta, if you can Geeta, help, Geeta, uh, could you step in and ask those questions, please? Yeah. Yeah, sure. So, um, So these are the, uh, the, there are two questions which may seem mundane, but I think the students present here would love to hear from you, uh, Vimal, on your advice uh, for young architects who uh, graduate and how do they transition from study to practice? This is Mustan Gupta from uh, University School of Architecture and Planning in uh, Delhi, and a similar question on what would your advice be for young architecture minds who want to set up their own firm? Could you elaborate on stages they have to go through and so on? Uh, this is Pratima Tati Konda from Andhra University College of Engineering. So, uh, listen, I have old-fashioned, uh, old-fashioned uh, views on this on this matter. Um, I said already in in response to a some issue earlier that I don't think the education of an architect is complete when they finish school. They are not practice ready, and I would say. that it's extremely extremely important to work for a couple of years at least with a firm that you respect and admire and that can provide you an opportunity to learn how to practice uh if you were to do that uh you would really save yourself a lot of trouble afterwards when you start your own practice i had the privilege of joining my father's firm Uh, like Narasia, and the amount of things I could learn because I was working with a whole set of experienced professionals uh, was, I mean, just absolutely crucial to to my development as a professional. There's simply no way I could have done what I did subsequently if I did not have the learning that I got in those first two three years. So that's really the important thing. the second most important thing to keep in mind is that eventually uh, um, all that you have is your credibility and reputation as a professional problem solver you if if you you know like a good doctor you you you, you it's it's word of mouth recommendation somebody will say yeah he solved my problem i go there so if you focus on trying to solve problems Uh, uh then that's a uh, uh solve other people problem with your own uh then uh, you know uh, and don't think of yourself as central or more important than the project or the client uh, uh you know 
you're, you're just part of a team along with the client trying to get the project to happen. If you think of it that way and build up a reputation as a, 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 as a credible problem solver, um, it's a step-by-step -step journey. There's no easy way I, I, you know, uh, to, 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 to tackle larger challenges. And uh, it's old fashioned advice. Uh, it's old fashioned stuff, but that's, that's all there is. There is no other shortcut. There's no royal road to, to becoming a successful uh, professional. And if you, you know, and those shortcuts eventually don't help. So that's that. Sorry if it sounds very old fashioned and boring, but that's what it is. No, I think, uh, uh, thank you. I think there were many questions in that same vein and uh, you've uh, kind of uh, addressed all that. There's, uh, although we had decided that we will not, we'll try and not talk about Corona today, but there are many who are again asking, there are particularly students and teachers who are saying, looking at this current situation, how does one cater to this paradigm shift that's likely to happen in education? This is from Prachi Sharma from Lokmani Tilak. Yeah, I, I know that a lot of people are interested in this issue. Okay. But let me say two things. Uh, I mean, there's going to be short term impact. I mean, even in our office, we are distancing and people sitting far apart. So the space standards all change, for example, in, in an office building or some. But I, I, I think that whether this is going to bring about fundamental changes or not, it's just too early to come to a conclusion. About this. I mean, think back at other crises of this sort that have happened in the past. If the plagues have not stopped cities from growing and people sort of coming together more and more, if, if the Spanish flu did not stop cities from growing and, 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 and int intensifying interaction, then perhaps this is also uh, not going to have that fundamental an effect. It's a little, it little perhaps uh, early to say that too. I mean, I don't know whether it's going to have an impact. I don't know whether it's going to have an impact. It's just hold. Uh, so a lot of reporters call me and ask me about these sort of things. I say, listen, this might be an interesting copy and might say something about it, but it's just too early to say anything, anything meaningful about this at this stage. And just let's let's hold our horses. Let's 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 tackle the problems as they come. And then let's look at the fundamental issues as they come and get get more established as fundamental issues. So that's to, that's to what I say. To a certain extent. Bangalore is a good example of seeing how much things could have changed because of the plague and it's triggered. I mean, there was already planning, uh, you know, um, Chamarajpet and uh, Malleshwaram, Jayanagar, which were, sorry, which were uh, sort of Basavangudi, which became really the models for uh, city planning afterwards. So there was some uh, deep impact in local planning. We, yeah, like you say, it's too early to... Yeah, it's too early to say that's all. It will have impacts. All, all these epidemics have, uh, pandemics have left some impact. I'm not saying no. Or when it fundamentally changes the fact that we won't need cities any longer, everybody will be working out of home, not working out. No, no, it's going to change things. That's for sure. Uh, and perhaps its biggest impact will be that this pandemic made everybody learn the power of, of internet, internet interactions, of online work. Will that mean that we will abolish all coming together to work? Perhaps not. We are going to see a hybrid, a right. lot more of a hybrid than we saw, saw uh, earlier. And it's, it's forced learning. So when they look back and they say, ah, so when they look back at, 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 at the Spanish flu and, and those times, they say, listen, all those uh, uh, TB and how TB used to create a problem in cities and that led to sanatoriums and buildings with more more light and ventilation is what was then thought of and, and became part of the game. Well, what's going to become part of the game is really online interactions, uh, perhaps. But as I said, too early to draw any firm conclusions about, about these issues. That's where we are. Vijay Naresh, any, any last question, comments that you'd like to make? I think we've exhausted the long discussion. So I can't think of anything new, but uh, yeah. Uh, We've been going on for two hours now. Yeah. So uh, I, can I can I make the concluding? Uh, yes, please. <laughs> right. 
that issues with mute mute yeah yeah sorry i i got bumped off on my again my i saw that i saw that. Yeah. yeah so i think uh, just to quickly summarize before handing back to geeta i think i think bimal i think a lot of the issues uh, about bringing clarity to the cv project as well as to other big projects in india i think we have gone a next step where maybe more consultation will be required as we go forward and particularly your points about how the education can change by better feedback more exposure to teachers also to understand the concept of urban practice versus urban theory etc etc i think would resonate to a lot of people who are considering a career in urban design and the changing the future of our cities themselves i think it's it's been a fairly good conversation quite long my mouth is already getting dry and I, mean, i don't see bimal drinking any water so i wonder whether he's got some other magic trick up his sleeve to you know and i think i'll hand back to geeta <laughs> now to, to conclude the session i think it's been an illuminating two and a half hours and i think it's a i think good feedback from from what i see on the chat channels also indeed this was this was a phenomenal discussion um, urban design is not the sca same scale as architecture and i was really glad to see the two and fro through questions and answers to unravel these processes i hope uh, uh, we we've, we've managed to answer more and uh, raise questions uh, a big thank you to you dr patel for readily accepting our invitation to a session where you were to be answering questions some tough ones that have been asked out there as well Uh, Naresh and Vijay, you've covered as much ground as you could in the limited time we had, and uh, Dr. Bimal, your responses have been succinct and have offered clarity on many aspects of the process of planning and pedagogy. Uh, I take this opportunity to thank each and every one of you present here. The recording of today's session will be uploaded in the dashboard uh, for your login to the lecture on ASED's website. I'd like to thank NASA. Uh, national association of students of architecture for their support this is uh, i'm sure has been helpful for students who joined us through their college broadcasts uh, and the nasa collaboration as well a shout out to colleges who broadcasted and shared this with their students sgb school of architecture and Pan planning bangalore uh, gary zell singh school of architecture and planning batinda chitwan engineering campus nepal incidentally showed a lot of interest uh, bharti vidyapeet mumbai alana college of architecture pune PVP College of Architecture Pune, Government Engineering College Trishur, and APID uh, APIED Vallabh Vidyanagar and Brick Pune. Thank you so much, and uh, look forward to seeing all of you at many more sessions. Thanks again, Dr. Patel. We'll be in touch. Just a second. I just want sure. to say thank thank you, Geeta, for this opportunity. I think it's important, very very uh, useful. And thank you, Naresh, and thank you, Vijay. Uh, um, I, I enjoyed the conversation. I I I hope it it. it Answered questions. Yes, I hope. I hope. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.